Mm. Why would it be inappropriate? Well, happy Veterans Day for a, a day. Well, I, I guess it, it is originally Armistice Day, right? From when they signed the Armistice for yeah. World War One. So in that sense, it's happy. But I think of Veterans Day not as a happy day, but as a, as, you know, like um, a day to remember all the challenge of, of wars and, and whatnot. So for me, it doesn't feel appropriate to say happy, but maybe somebody else has a different perspective on that. Doug, you're our resident historian. What do you think about happy, happy uh, Veterans Day? <laughs> well, I agree with you. It's got very mixed connotations. It's uh, good to have survived, but it's terrible that we had these wars. So having Veterans Day, you can't tell whether it's honoring one or the other. I think it's already be late. I was trying to get the X-Wing to start up and I think something's not working. Cantankerous machines, aren't they? They're not reliable. I think that's the problem. I think <laughs> that's why the Rebel Alliance has always had trouble. It's like, they can't get parts, the parts break. Nobody knows how to fix them. You need like eight fingers to hold a certain part in place and that's not working. Designed yeah. by committee. Uh, yeah. David Brin says the problem is that Lucas is fixated on World War I fighters. Makes sense. Interesting. World War One. So like two wings kind of. B. Well, yeah, and also the relatively open cockpit and the dog fight. You know, he's got this weird uh, connection between the very earliest form of air combat and you know lasers and all all the quasi modern stuff. These lasers. Um, yeah, yeah, and and ironically, they studied uh, lots of World War II dogfight footage to do the dogfights in space in Star Wars, which where the physics of space are entirely different because there is no air. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or Bryn gravity has, from Earth. Or Bryn has quite a rant on this, and he also has yeah. a rant against uh, Yoda and against basically the, the values, the ethic of Star There's Wars versus Star Trek. Yoda. Huh? Oh yeah, gosh, for he's a rent against Yoda. That's like heresy. Yeah, well, he's got some good points. I, I, I was surprised when I listened to it, but a big factor is Star Trek is naval. It's a ship. It should the ship carries the culture with it. Star Wars is heroes and superheroes, and so Star Wars is inherently undemocratic. Whereas Star Trek even though the captain is running everything, he kind of has to, he's, he has to draw upon everybody, all the resources in order to make good decisions and, and pull himself out of the kind of trouble that they get into. That's really, do you have, if you have links to Bryn's essay, and if this is from Bryn's essay, I'd love to add that in. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I, well, I heard it actually in a clubhouse room. He was live saying this, but I'm pretty sure that there is an essay, which I can get a link to and I will, uh, I will send it to you. Yeah, cool. I found it. And I found it. It's surprising and enlightening. And here's this army, that, this, yeah. Just say, here's another way that Lucas was also interested in early 20th century. Take a look at the um, two figures here. Metropolis. Metropolis. Maria from Metropolis. Gee, that's an that's an original idea, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was all derivative. I mean, once you've invented metal robots that go danger, Will Robinson danger. Um, this army navy split is really interesting. Um, if I'm, if I may, just tell a short tale. Um, in the pre-modern British aristocracy, kind of the 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 Pax Britannica, uh, rule Britannia, Britain, um, the navy was aristocratic and the army was sort of meritocratic in a market, meaning you were born into a Navy family, you were put on board a Navy ship. If you were a, a, a male in the family, chances are you got put on board a fighting ship at age nine as a midshipman whose job it was to stay alive and eventually become an admiral. Because <clears throat> if you lived long enough, you'd probably become an admiral, um, unless you were just completely incompetent or you betrayed the crown. Um, and then in the army, you could buy and sell commissions. So you could buy yourself a sergeantcy and a colonelcy. And at some point that peters out, at some point in the army, you can no longer uh, buy your commissions. But the, there was a market, there was an open market for commissions 
uh, and you just sort of upgraded through purchases, which is kind of weird and interesting. And then um, on a land battle, um, you can put observers on the hills nearby who name the battle and declare the winner and, and observe and see who shirked their duty and all that kind of stuff. So you can kind of watch a land battle and report on it. So um, on a naval battle, it's halfway around the world. You're not going to hear the outcome of the battle for three months. Um, how do you know they're acting in the crown's be in the crown's uh, benefit? And so the in the navy had a whole bunch of very strict rules. Um, the British navy, in particular, that made that helped make Britain's navy the dominant navy the, of, of the seas for uh, 150 years, um, and that included they had to attack from windward. Everybody know what windward and leeward is. Uh, windward is where the wind is coming from. Leeward is the other side, the, the, the shelter from the wind. If you're on the leeward side of a building, you're you're trying to block the wind. Um, if you have, if you have, if you must attack from windward, windward gauge, um, that means you're being blown into the enemy. You can't escape. And the French and the Spanish fleets and admirals had instructions to attack from leeward, and so they could they could break free and go. And if you can't escape, you're going to train your gunners a little better. And so, so English gunnery was more accurate. They were just better at it, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, Allison, I'm going to mute. Oh, I, I don't know if I can mute you. Um, but Allison, I'm hearing some noise from your, your line. Thank you. Um, and then um, they had to maintain line of battle, which means uh, like elephants uh, nose to tail uh, when they attack. That was just the way they attacked because it's really easy to tell who falls out of line. Uh, and then falling out of line and in fact, not pursuing the enemy, even when you had won a battle, but not pursuing the enemy to try to destroy them was reason for being court-martialed and uh, having your rank stripped. They had to be insanely aggressive. And then also in, on board ship, the captain like is God. Every, everything the captain says matters. There's all kinds of really bad discipline. It's a crazy thing. But anyway, the age of sail is, is crazy. If you wanna get acquainted with the age of sail, read the Aubrey Maturin novels by Patrick O'Brien. Sorry for the long regression, but the whole, the whole, the whole army versus navy thing is also interesting in Japan. But I don't know nearly as much about it. But uh, the, the age of sail in Britain is super, super interesting. No worries, Allison. Thank you. Um, so we are going to talk about the metaverse, which one could consider an age of sail simulation to be maybe part of the metaverse. Just trying to make a bridge there. Um, and I finished watching uh, Ready Player One last night. Uh, so I feel prepared to talk about the metaverse in some sense, because I feel like I was just in a movie that goes way deep into like what it is, how it works, who invents it, who gets to own it, uh, all those kinds of things. And I'd love to just pause for a second and see, um, Wendy, I think you proposed metaverse. Um, and uh, if you had any opening thoughts and uh, see where we want to take the conversation, because we're uh, this Thursday, we're doing a topic and our topic is metaverse. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, I'm really just going to pull from our last conversation. I had proposed it because it had come up a couple times in the conversation. I was particularly interested in talking about what we feel the term meant before and how we feel it's been appropriated and what that kind of means for us now in terms of how we ref do we reframe it uh, and so just curious what emerges from from starting from that platform. Love that. So um, has the term been appropriated? What does that mean? Anyone else want to jump in? I think a bunch, I think a few people feel strongly that the term is now kind of sullied, soiled, stained. Uh, please, Pete. Um, so metaverse comes from science fiction, uh, 80s science fiction. Um, Neil Stevenson, I, Snow Crash, right? Um, uh, coined a thing called metaverse and um, it, it looks not unlike Ready Player One. Um, I think uh, Stevenson's was a little bit more rough and a little bit more diverse. But along with, you know, Stevenson maybe coined the, the, the term. And I think actually there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting story about the coining of the term. Um, but but the, the general idea of it has been around for a while, you know, that there's a kind of a virtual reality place that you can interact with other humans um, in virtual reality rather than, than actual reality or augmented reality or, or whatever. So, um, 
so if you were in Second Life, uh, you were participating in kind of the idea of a metaverse and Second Life people. Sec Second Life was a really early, you know, um, you can be a person or uh, uh, some kind of non-person entity um, and wear different clothes and have a, a room and meet with other people and stuff like that. So the idea has been around forever. Lots of different people uh, contributing to it, thinking about it, um, you know, making it um, a, a a way of thinking about stuff. And I guess um, maybe an analogy for us at this time um, in history is to think of the web. People used to say, oh, there's going to be, you know, going back to Van Ever uh, Bush um, uh, or Ted Nelson or Doug Engelbart. They were talking about this place where there was lots of information. It was all linked together. And um, there was going to be a plethora of this stuff that like, um, you couldn't even imagine how much information you could have at your fingertips and cross-reference and link and stuff like that. So that was a way of describing the web before we had the web. Um, then the web happened and it happened in a way that that kind of makes sense um, and kind of doesn't make sense. Um, there are things about the web that, that you know, the science fiction writers didn't really guess. Um, there's broken things about it. There's good things about it. Um, there's kind of a path of development uh, from you know where we were to where we got to. Um, metaverse is kind of the same thing. It, it, you know, we've been talking. Science fiction authors have been talking about virtual reality and second worlds and things like that forever, um, forty years. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, it's it's odd to me that um, that Zuckerberg is apparently fascinated by the idea of, you know, he, he used to dream about this stuff in high school, probably having read a bunch of science fiction and not having enough of a social life or something. Um, so now we get to this point and it's like, oh my God, we should have this virtual reality thing where everybody's interacting. And oh, by the way, um, you know, I've, I've already built this thing that, um, that feeds on human interaction and emotionality to make a, um, uh, a hyperstructure thing uh, that I think is beautiful and wonderful. Everybody's interacting and everybody's connected to each other, and everybody's like, you know, I if so if you, um, I I'm sure Zuckerberg is happy with Facebook the way it is. But if you kind of lift and shift it to the side, if you look at it from the other direction, you're you're going. Facebook is this thing that kind of took over a big chunk of culture and warped it in bad ways um, because um, it's it's a centralization force. Everybody gets fed through the same um, algorithms and the same you know constructs. Uh, everybody is ends up it's it's kind of like the United States except on steroids and going you know a thousand times faster or something like that. It smushes all of culture into if it fits in Facebook, it's culture. If it doesn't fit in Facebook, it's not culture. You know, it's like What's up with that? Um, so it's interesting at this point in Facebook's evolution for Zuckerberg to say, oh my God, we're gonna have this thing called the metaverse and it's beautiful and wonderful and it's gonna be everything. And you know, so to me, it sounds like Facebook 2.0 or Facebook 3.0, however you wanna start counting. You know, it's it's not super interesting to me. It's, it's, it sounds dangerous. It sounds centralizing. It sounds, um, um, uh, it, it sounds enclosed, enclosure, inclusive. It sounds like he's grabbing um, some cool ideas and stuff like that, but then saying, okay, well, the metaverse now, and and he's got a lot of weight and power. He's got uh, hundreds of billions of dollars um, and billions of, of subscribers behind him. So when he says, or his team, he and his team say, well, we're gonna have the metaverse and it's gonna be a Facebook metaverse. You know, it's like, yeah, it's that that feels to me a lot like if in uh, if in 1995 um, GE said we're going to have a web and it's going to be the GE web or, you know, or we're going to have uh, the AOL web and there's not going to be other webs. There's just going to be the AOL web. And it's like, well, I don't know if that's the you know, that's the way that I don't want to play that game. I don't want to play that centralization game. I don't want to play with, you know, one person leading a, a small team out of one country in the world um, who happens to be the pinnacle of capital capitalism deciding, you know, how we're going to play the metaverse game or how we're going to play the web game or how we're going to. So 
um, it, it feels like stealing to me, stealing from culture and in a way that doesn't even acknowledge or understand what it's stealing or what it's doing in, in the same way that Facebook has done that already for a couple of years. You know, it's it stole elections, it steals national governments, it's it steals culture, it, it eats them and it and it doesn't give back. Or it, it doesn't give how, back very well. Um, I love what you just said, Pete, and it's funny how much it resonates with Ready Player One. Um, because the protagonist, Parsifal, in, in, Ready, in Ready Player One, understands the inventor of the Oasis deeply, and that's how he wins the game. I'm, it's a bit of a plot spoiler, but really, I'm not ruining it for you, I promise. Um, our, our friend Nicole Lazaro asked if, if uh, you know, who's, who is Zuckerberg in Ready Player One? You know, which character would he be? Yeah, and exactly. And then, and, and then the, 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 the dude who is the peak of the enterprise that wants to own the Oasis doesn't understand any of this kind of stuff and is trying to own it. And is, it, it's very zucky. So, and I think it was Nicole's comment that made me say, I must watch Ready Player One now. Yeah. Um, so anyone want to add on, riff, layer in? John, please. Sure. John and Grace. Hi. I'm in a noisy uh, Oakland cafeteria having breakfast. So if it gets too loud, let me know and I'll, I'll mute. We can hear um, you just fine. Great. So there's a couple, couple possible structures of the conversation. One structure would be to say, what are the big alternatives that are in play? In other words, there's already a player there and they're already moving towards a different kind of metaverse than, than Zucks. And uh, then the other one is what are the theoretical ones that are kind of in play, but they, they would need a tremendous boost in terms of resources and uh, energy to go. So among the players, among the alternative versions of the uh, metaverse is the uh, game-based one, you know, the, using something like Unity. Um, uh, you, basically, people start with a game environment since they've already solved a lot of the problems of how do you represent things. And um, so there's a whole line of development going there. And I know uh, Jack has thought carefully about the evolution of game thinking and the possibilities of change of, of leveraging game thinking for very positive uh, social outcomes. I would also strongly recommend the movie Free Guy if you haven't seen it. Uh, very interesting plot twist, kind of a reverse Grand Theft Auto in which a, uh, a non-playing character, a robot, essentially becomes conscious and starts doing the opposite of the Grand Theft Auto model starts doing good things for people and then that goes viral and it's like ted lasso in cyberspace ted lasso in cyberspace it's, yeah that's it's so crazy, crazy. <laughs> it is crazy <laughs> definitely you want to see that movie but now now there's the other one the other important one is a whole bunch of small distributed uh web distributed metaverse <laughs> efforts and you would want to include um self-sovereign identity as a necessary component, if you were going to have, first of all, you got to start with interoperability. You got to say, yeah, you can have your metaverse, but the only way people will come in is if they can leave, and if they can leave with all their data. Well, that implies a whole lot of things. It implies uh, interoperable wallets, interoperable data, things, a huge amount of infrastructure work has to be done. Some people interested in self-sovereign identity and related topics, identity, are working on those things, they're very comparatively extremely under-resourced. So it would take quite a, a natural, from a business point of view, a business unnatural act for the distributed, open, interoperable version of the metaphors to emerge. I don't think regulation blocking the current version would be enough to cause the distributed one to emerge. I'm still looking for ways in which that might happen, either a, a benevolent uh, billionaire or you know something that puts enough juice behind um, the interoperability standards um, that it can happen. Just a little footnote, there was a point I believe that Microsoft was saying it was gonna have its own wallet and they were talked to by the self-sovereign people and they were convinced that they should not have a, you know, if they were gonna do anything like a wallet, it needed to be interoperable and you needed you needed to accept people who didn't you know hook up with other microsoft apps and it needed to allow people to leave and go to another app 
and they, uh, this is now, my information is now 18 months old, so it might have changed since then, but they agreed mostly for market reasons. They realized they were in a relatively weak position in this space. And they needed to be, inter be interoperable in order to have even a toehold. That may have changed mm -hmm. since then. Um, so that's just some outline to, to take the discussion forward. Um, so two tiny comments before I pass to Grace. Uh, one is, thank goodness we have so many newly minted billionaires because there's, it increases the odds that even one of them might actually be beneficent and grant us the funds to go build out a good world like this. That's, I, that really relieves me a lot. And then the second thing is, I think some people won't want to enter a metaverse that doesn't have self-sovereign and a bunch of other stuff, but Facebook and Instagram and all these things kind of prove the point that a whole bunch of humanity really doesn't care what happens to their data or doesn't seem to. And they were willing to pour their entire lives private info into these platforms with little hesitation because they're all in there, right? So I think that's interesting. And then, and then there's this interesting part of Zuckerberg's pitch about the metaverse that says it has to be diverse. It can't be this one big thing. And there's kind of a poison pill he's carrying into his own premise which he seems to be trying to say that this thing does need to be distributed and have some sovereignty, but it's like, you kind of know that it can't if he's building it and it won't if he's building it, right? And it's like, hmm, I wonder how that's going to play out. Um, Grace, then Klaus. Yeah, I hope my internet's good enough. I'm getting some- We hear you well, go ahead. Okay, good. It's really interesting. Like I find myself thinking completely different things from what's been said so far. So for, for example, to me, Facebook is a dying company. And this is like this kind of like weird kicking and screaming thing that they're doing. Now, Facebook may have some foothold in developing countries where it's the only way for people to access the internet. But in the Western world, it's just diving in popularity. Um, and I found that since stopping, since I stopped using it, I miss it not even one bit at all. And so it's this kind of aging thing and this, this like, so I, when I think about the metaverse, it's really, you know, like kind of a bizarre thing that Zuckerberg is calling it metaverse because it's not the metaverse. And the gaming community has had multiple metaverses for a very long time, as has been pointed out. And, and it's, it, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of like self-sovereign identity, I mean, the thing that's coming up really fast right now, like insanely fast is these play to earn games in the NFT world. And I, I see it because I write a lot of white papers and I just see where the money's going. I mean, there's billions of dollars in, I think there's $3 billion market cap in that market right now and these companies are raising millions of dollars 10 to 20 million dollars on these icos in the area of play to earn games now for those of you who don't know what this thing is it's this bizarre weird thing that started with um something called i guess more or less the big one is axie infinity and basically if these people in low-cost countries the philippines is kind of the leader in this where these play these games for speculative cryptocurrency and they trade it out and they're earning 15 to $30 a day, which is a living wage there by playing these games and speculative cryptocurrencies. And these are adventure games and online um, uh, role-playing games. And, and the, there's a whole bunch of weird business models, but mostly it's speculative cryptocurrency business models, which are gonna be not sustainable, but um, the millions of dollars that are being invested right now into other play to earn games to create these metaverses, I'm seeing some really interesting stuff coming in there. And you know, Second Life is a perfect example of somewhere where people were able to actually earn a living doing these in game metaverse crafts and where there were multi, I'm gonna say were, but I mean, of course the second life still exists where people create these multiple worlds and these multiple different kinds of, of businesses. And the businesses are all kinds of things that you would see in the real world. It's like, oh, do you want a magic shield? We'll go down to the blacksmith then the blacksmith will is make shields and you can buy a shield off the blacksmith. Or, you know, there's all kinds of whatever it is, there's a there's a mine that mines for whatever materials you need to build your home and all these kinds of things that 
look like real life, but you know, whatever. And then you can build your museum and in charge people entrance. And so these universes are coming online as and people are making livings at them and have always, I mean, e-gaming is bigger than soccer at this point in terms of the audience size. So this, the metaverse is out there and it's, or in here in this box where we're talking to each other. And it's incredibly multifaceted with multiple worlds and real people earning real money. And it's very, it ranges from super interesting, very cool, fun stuff that you know you're like yeah that's kind of a cool way to make a living you know that's to stuff that's like the matrix where all you're doing is sitting there all day and going like this so you can make enough money as a philippine person and then you feed yourself and then you go back and do this all day and so it's this weird multifaceted thing so i don't think about facebook as a potential player in this they can do whatever they want as far as giving a name but i don't see them as a potential player in in, in the actual multiverse Brief thing, um, I think Facebook's monthly usage dropped off a little bit for the first time ever last month. Uh, I think they're still growing like gangbusters. So, so they don't, their, their numbers don't look like a dinosaur on its way out, you know, off the playing field. Um, but I get, what, I get what you're saying and I get that there's sort of a, a feeling in the air about that. But, um, but thank you. That, that, and you've put a whole bunch of other lively and, and, and lovely uh, topics on the table, including these damn, they, I think they should be called pay to play to earn games because you don't just sort of walk in and start playing a game. And like, it's like, and there's a whole bunch of games online where it's free to play. And that means you install the game, you create a character, you start playing, and then you do whatever it is. And usually with those games, you buy with real dollars, some in-game currency, and you buy gear and decorations for your avatars and superpowers or whatever. That's been known for a while. These new ones that are that are working online in cryptocurrencies, you actually have to own some cryptocurrency to play, and that means you have to buy the cryptocurrency to get in. And but now there's there's kind of companies like Axie University that actually will lend you that currency so you can earn your way to get the currency to buy to play to whatever. It's really a little more. It's sort of more complicated than than just play. To, I think play to earn to me is a really facile, misleading uh, moniker for this for this category. Um, in some ways. So, um, Mr. Mager. But you're talking about uh, sorry, some wait, rent you want to jump back in. But I would say, I would say those rent seeking behaviors are going to disappear, right? Those are kind of rent seeking behaviors. That's just friction. Like, that's just early friction. It's just early friction. Like we'll lend you some money and then you pay us back at rent seeking interest, but that's going to disappear really quickly, I think. Thanks. Um, Klaus? Yeah. So, uh, I just had, uh, an introduction <laughs> to this thing. We're working cool. with we're working with a vendor from Spain <clears throat> who is uh, trying to get into the North American market with uh, um, an ingenious type of grain mill. You know, so they they, they can mill rice and grains and all sorts of uh, seeds, uh, and then turn that in mix that uh, into some really interesting uh, products. So. Um, I mean, I didn't, we got sent this box here and I gave it to my son and can you figure this out for me? And he came back and he showed me how to play games on it. And I'm going, wow, this is cool stuff, but you know, pretty, the, the, the graphics are just enormous. I mean, incredible, right? I mean, it's, it's stunning stuff. So then, uh, then I found out, no, that was really a purpose for getting this sent over because they wanted us to visit their factory in uh, Barcelona. And uh, so we, we onboard it you now and, and uh, then you, you, you link all up, you get a password, you link up and then you enter you, through a portal into their domain. Uh, and they have set up what I think is going to be the trade show of the future, an enormous huge hall, you know, you could walk around in it, you get an avatar you know, to, to when, you, when you first join. Um, and then we went into the machine room and you could literally climb into the machine and look at it from the inside. I mean, it's just stunning uh, how, that, how that all works. But then, of course, I'm, I'm thinking, why are, we, uh, why are we getting into this right now? Because we're going into a community that is struggling with homelessness, you know, with people who don't have enough food to eat and 
with farmers who need to figure out how to you know, rejuvenate their soil and what to do. And so I'm like, this is, this is just, I mean, I couldn't even comprehend their marketing approach, right? Um, am I supposed to give this to a farmer <laughs> in the Belarus, right? I mean, what are these people supposed to do with that? So, so there is, I think there is really, they, they got themselves all bedazzled with this technology um but but not really not really link up with the nate with the people that they're trying to connect with so by default they're going to skim the top layer of the economy again without reaching into you know where the need is where you really need to have make change yeah so i can see kids being absolutely mesmerized i mean my wife's first reaction was i'm so glad that wasn't around when we were raising our children you know, because our son Michael would have just been lost in this. You know? um, and then, but economically, I mean, I can see, you know, you can have engineering meetings, you can literally stand in front of a, um, a Myros board, right, and, and, and do stuff while you are uh, uh, in this, in this uh, 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 you know, created space. So, yeah, I mean, you can't stop it, it's out there. But I don't know that it uh, that it will solve the kinds of problems that we are that we are right now dealing with. I uh, love that class. Thank you. Um, anyone want to riff on where we are? So we're done with the conversation. This is awesome. I'm so glad. Like in 32 minutes, we we dealt with the metaverse. Ken, jump in. Um, well, I just was looking at Gil's comment, and I really agree. Uh, I just saw a an article I did not read about somebody saying, you know, the metaverse could make uh, reality disappear. And it's like, we have a, a, a planet that we depend upon for all of our life support that's being ignored in many ways and degraded in many ways. And there's all this energy being put into, we'll just create a virtual reality, everything is fine. And um, so that seems to me to be a, a little bit of a priority problem. Just so I've always thought, opinion. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm off, I've long thought that these billionaires trying to like get off this rock because we've broken this rock, like the motivation for Musk and Bezos and all those, a lot of their motivation is we've already ruined this planet. If we don't <clears throat> quickly execute on humanity's mandate and populate other rocks, we're going to extinct ourselves. Uh, and so I kind of get that. And then I just realized in what you said that another path out is to upload ourselves so that when the planet is in fact uninhabitable for humans, if machines can, can be self-sufficient and can collect enough energy to build and replicate themselves, then we'll merely be, you know, we'll merely be interacting in the, in the metaverse or many metaverses. And, and then all bets are off with what current reality is like. And that's a different escape hatch, right? Then both of which are cynical and terrible alternatives to like trying to fix our broken planet. Um, and, and, the, and the amount of energy being wasted in this effort is really tremendous. And like, like it's, it's uh, one other angle here for me is um, long ago, uh, Xerox Park traded money for time. So Xerox Park bought everybody, every one of their white color workers, they bought them <clears throat> a megapixel display, a million pixels on screen. Uh, a megabit of memory, which was or maybe it was a megabyte, probably a megabyte of memory, which is memory was computer memory was really expensive. This is in the 70s, I think. And a megabit connection to each other through an, an early network so that they could talk to each other. And it was a it was like, who needs all of this? Like like early computers weren't that powerful, didn't have big, big bitmap displays and all that. And from that trading of time for money, we have the interface that we're using today because we can draw a really nice set of lines that, that connect the windows and, and mouse and trackpad interface that we're using right now to those experiments back in the day. And those experiments were wasteful. Um, similarly, when, you, when you're designing a Windows interface, there's a piece of your computer that's in a little loop, an eternal fast loop going, where's the mouse? Where's the mouse? Can I follow the mouse? Did it click? Did somebody click the mouse? Well, where's the mouse? Where's the mouse? Where's the mouse? Where's the mouse? And that little loop sort of owns what happens and cascades afterwards because once you click, a whole bunch of other program code you know, comes into being. It's incredibly wasteful of the cycles, but, but otherwise your computer would be sitting there idle. <clears throat> so here I look at expensive gear that has to do a tremendous amount of work. I mean, LiDAR, if you're going to map a room to do augmented reality, you know, the, the work your, your little goggle and chips and whatever are doing to try to map what, your, what room you were in so you can reliably walk through it, never mind track the fact that four humans just passed through it or that somebody moved a chair, 
Uh, but just, just the work to map a room is a lot of compute power for arguably uh, zero benefit for anybody. In particular, if somebody's gonna play, just sit there and play a game for a while. That's a tremendous amount of resources wasted. And I'm like, there are times when a waste of resources are really, really useful and good and predict and, and, and lead us into a new world. And there are times when a waste of resources is just that, I think, a waste of resources. And my big fear right now from all the things I see that I, I sent everybody a link to a new TEDx talk from a guy who's wearing a headset the whole time, has uh, his controllers in, in his hands. Uh, he's, he's got some buddies over with him in a virtual mock-up of the stage. And there's like six people in avatars over off, off to the side. And at no moment during the talk does he excite anyone about the metaverse or use the device that he's wearing. We don't see his face because he's got a godforsaken mask on. Um, it's, it's awful. Like, like the, the talk was awful. I was just like, wow, this is totally not a sales pitch to get people into the metaverse, except for the tone of excitement in his voice. He was on fire about this thing that's taking over our world. And was talking, you know, talking about a lot of these things. So, so I'm, um, you know, I've been wrong about a couple of these things. I was like, why, who needs a camera on cell phones? Like, seriously, that just must be the, the, that must be the carriers trying to sell us more minutes of, of uh, you know, cellular connectivity because video is so consumptive of bandwidth. And it turns out now that we all have high definition cameras like on these little slabs of unobtainium that we carry all the time. And it's changed how human events happen. It's changed how we, a whole bunch of stuff. Like it's changed how we record our lives. That's wasteful, but wow, right? So I don't know, uh, waste ring for anybody? I, Pete. the, um... It, it, it's it's an, it's an interesting argument, and and I find it a little bit hard to refute refute it with a straight face. But um, but I, I I think there really is a pony there. I think VR and AR and things like that are real and they're useful. Um, so I, it's more like um, you know it's it's more like the cell phone thing. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of waste in here, but there's a lot of utility too. Um, you know, so the, the fact that we have GPSs was kind of a weird, you know, it's weird that we've shrunk GPSs or um, the, uh, the accelerometers, you know, the accelerometers came from airbags and, you know, cameras, why would you put a camera in, in your phone and all that kind of stuff. The convergence of this device is multiplicative in a way that you wouldn't have guessed a priori, right? Um, uh, being able to do navigation or being able to call for help or I don't know, being able to have the, the finger, world of information at my fingertips in, in, in a little slab. Um, it's a change that in, you know, 1990, we would have, 1980, it's like, why would you squeeze all of that into a little box? And it's a waste. I, it's not. So I think AR and VR is the same thing. So, um, arguing that metaverse is is pointless because we can't imagine what uh, AR VR is going to bring to us I think it's the wrong direction I, I I'm not there so I, I totally agree with what you just said um, and I think there's a pony there also and I will make a further claim that open global mind as a quest and a journey is in fact an exploration of a useful kind of metaverse that could be layered onto reality as ultra augmented reality, could be an idea space that we co-inhabit and try to solve the world's problems and share stories about what works, like the story that Klaus was sharing. Uh, I'm on a different mailing list where I was just reading about Willie Smits, uh, who figured out a way to, to grow crops and fix, uh, you know, recreate forestry uh, uh, in the middle of, of uh, I think, Borneo. <clears throat> a whole bunch of interesting, but like there's world solutions out there to be done. And instead we're busy creating metaverses that are about, hey, can I buy that sweater that she's wearing who just walked by? And to me that there's like, there's totally a pony there somewhere. <clears throat> and, and, or worse, we have people who got shoved indoors by the pandemic and can't make their living the normal way, which is selling cigarettes to cars that pass by on the road. Uh, and so are playing Axie Infinity and making, you know, a little bit more than they could make turking on Amazon Turk, which hurts my soul by sitting here getting carpal tunnel playing a game. And by the way, I think, and I'm not sure about this, I think that when some people make enough money to, to you know, to pay the rent or to buy some food, there's some people in Axie Infinity who are losing money. 
and who like I don't, I don't I don't think there's an abundance economy where there's just like oh, everybody's making money. I think there's you you beat people in a contest. That's what Axie Infinity is. It's a very simple contest between these little axolotl avatars, <clears throat> and there's losers, um, and there's money at stake in it. It's a form of gambling. So so it's it's also like the stupid irony that Native American tribes make money because mostly they have casinos. It's like God. Damn it! Couldn't we figure out any other way to get some funds into Native American tribes? So, so I'm, I'm, my soul is hurting when I see these, these sort of disjuncts because I see the pony that Peach has described, and it looks like a unicorn with sparkles and wings, like, like it's, 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 it's in there someplace. And for me, this OGM quest we've been on is a quest toward some of that pony in some sense, um, but a very, very, very different one materially and virtually from the one we're seeing. Go ahead, Kim. I just, um, I rewatched uh, Fantastic Fungi the other day. My neighbor had it, just got a brand new TV, a high def Blu-ray, all that. It was, it was an amazing film. And I'm thinking, there's an example for me of how uh, AR and VR could be used for really great education of understanding natural systems and how we can start to um, use natural systems principles and, and practices to heal and restore and regenerate the degraded ecosystems that we're inhabiting. And um, it seems like the, the driving force behind AR and VR is consumption. It's the same thing that's always driven capitalism. Like how are we gonna get people to buy into this and, and spend money on it instead of how can we use this as an educational tool to help heal the world? Um, kind of like what we do with, you know, the television was recognized a long time ago as a tremendously powerful educational medium and yet it, it shifted over to mostly advertising and sales. So Pete, what I'm curious what this is. Just the, the, the driving, I, well, AR and VR hasn't done that thing that TV did that, that went, you know, into um, it's just a, a big, um, a big time sink. Um, AR and VR is, 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 it's in, it's in between, it's still in flux. Um, and there are a bunch of people doing, you know, uh, let's, let's cure PTSD, um, by strapping you in an, into a VR rig, you know? Um, so it's, give me some mushrooms. <laughs> probably, probably that too. The, uh, so, um, so AR and VR is still like, it's still a little infant. It hasn't grown up to be a waste of time. It's it's the the money going into it. A lot of it is is spent on good things, not bad things. Education or um, getting people together virtually, or you know whatever. Um, somebody, if somebody with whose name started with a Z said, "Oh wow, I'm going to spend ten billion dollars on VR um, and make it the make it the my vision." That's a place where it's like, okay, maybe that's you know, maybe that's, uh, maybe it's starting to go, maybe the baby is going to grow up a bad way. It, it just got kidnapped by, you know, by somebody and, and it's going to be raised poorly. Well, there's a really interesting question we started with, which was, it has the metaverse been fully appropriated? Are we doomed to Zuckerberg's vision because of the mass and scale and wealthy and wealth of this enterprise? Or are there many metaverses and are they just competing and how might that play out, et cetera, et cetera? I think that that's a really important it's, at this stage. It's, 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 it's both of those, right? It's not either one of those. There are many, like Vic Grace says, there's many metaverses already and they're thriving, wonderful, you know, uh, amazing things. Um, and we're not going to end up with only Zuckerberg's metaverse. We're just not. It's somewhere in the middle. The the thing that bothers me about Zuckerberg and saying, "Hey, I'm going to spend ten billion dollars on this, and and I'm going to keep spending ten billion dollars on it probably every year until, you know, I I own, um, you know, just like I own two point three billion people's computers right now, I want to own two point three billion faces, you know, and their eyes and their ears and stuff like that, right? That's what he's saying. So whether or not he gets to two point three billion. The fact that he's saying that and he's going to to try to get a billion as fast as possible um, and the fact that facebook is already a nation state size thing when it goes to talk to you know the president of the united states or the un or something like that um, zuckerberg says i you know conceptually i mean the politics doesn't work out this way quite but when he's got 2 billion people on his platform and they're thinking the way Facebook makes them think, that, you know, that isn't a thing that even the US can do. 
the U.S. does that kind of, you know, let's change um, 4 billion people's minds. But the way it does that is the kind of the industrial area, you know, the, the, the 60s to 80s way to do that. You invent my, McDonald's and you, you drop in, you know, with World Bank and you drop in with GE Capital and GE whatever. That's the way that we used to do it. Facebook has taken all of that strength that something like the U.S. used to uh, influence the world with and suck it into one company and do that in uh, a few years rather than you know five or five or six decades. So when when Zuckerberg says there shall be a metaverse and it shall be the Facebook metaverse, it's not that I worry that we're only going to end up there. It's that I worry that in the spectrum, the 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 center of gravity just shifted significantly towards that. And, and it's, and that's not a good thing. It's just not. Um, Pete, love that. Klaus, then Michael, and I just want to point out that uh, the monthly average users of Facebook is larger than the entire populations of China and India combined. And yet Facebook is not treated in any sense as a country, which is I think a big and interesting issue that needs to be covered. Klaus, then Michael. Yeah, the, the, the technology is continuing to advance, right? I mean, the, 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 the technological development is just on a track that will move forward. What is, what is completely lacking is the imagination of what you can do with it. And like Ken was pointing out, you know, towards using this in, in, a, in a way that is uh, uh, constructive, you know, healing and so on. Uh, so the, the first impetus is how much more money can we squeeze out of this thing? We can sell games to everyone, right? Where the, the real need is in places where you don't have uh, billions of, of revenue uh, uh, instantly available, right? I mean, the need, particularly here in the United States, but really at the global level, is to engage in the, in the uh, social systems that we refer to as base of pyramid, there's no money in the base of pyramid, but there is a lot of problems there, uh, which, which bring the entire pyramid down if we don't fix it. Right? So, so Zuckerberg has like zero vision because this could have been introduced to show kids, for example, how climate change is impacting us, you know, how the science works. I mean, there could be so much exciting uh, uh, visualization of things that we not try to tell kids. I mean, in my last webinar, uh, uh, that was the founder for community food system. Uh, no, I, I had an exchange with Sophie, who, who was one of the founding members of the Menus of Change initiative with Harvard. And, and she, she, she was saying, you have children today, you know, the greater Thunberg generation on fire about climate change, clueless about agriculture, food, you know, and the impact they are having with their own behavioral uh, uh, lack of behavioral adjustments. So, so you could use a tool like this that brings millions, even billions of people into it. And, and instead of some stupid game, and my son was furiously moving around here, shooting things down with, uh, with this game, right? I mean, instead of using this for, uh, for this urgently needed uh, education that, that we need to, uh, to, to bring out into communities, we're creating more confusion, more havoc uh, with this. And this is really where uh, Zuckerberg, I think, is devoid of empathy, devoid of understanding about uh, you know, social systems and, and, and our own survival, our collective, collective survival, really depending on bringing people into a level of understanding. Um, Klaus, thank you very much. Love that. Uh, Michael then Stewart. Um, I want to bring in something we've been talking about a little bit in the chat that circles back to what Klaus mentioned earlier about why, why he had the, the VR goggles um, and kind of uh, set me on the, on the thought that um, virtual travel, I mean, what I was saying in the chat is like virtual travel is going to demand that um, uh, people in exotic locations um, don cameras and exoskeletons so that they can be avatars for travelers in the first world in their living rooms to go wherever and, and turn a corner in wh whichever way. 
um, and and Pete was was uh, posting a link to um, the Amazon Explorer thing, which is is a more positive thing. Wendy was mentioning, uh, you know, giving people who wouldn't otherwise have an access to nature and access to nature um, and different places. And then then I was just thinking about this play on Meta slash Facebook's part that, okay, they've got 2 billion, uh, let's 2. Four. what's that? 2.4 billion monthly average users, if that's the number you're looking for. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I was just- Yeah, we, 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 we don't hear them, you, you're muted. What's that? Yeah. At least 2.8, maybe three. Okay. Um, and is my uh, sound not coming through so well? Uh, Michael, you're fine. Your sound is doing fine. Oh, okay. Gil, who was, Gil was being vociferous, uh, yet his little mute icon was uh, with us. Whoa. <laughs> and something just had a cataclysm. Your, virtu your virtual world just got corrupted. My virtual world. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I was going to say I is that. Is that uh, See, you can you can see the man behind the curtain, or the the world behind the curtain. Um, it's crazy. Uh, the Munchkins are that, cute, though. <laughs> that um, sorry, derailed my train of thought slightly. Oh, so he's got these, you know, two point eight billion uh, virtual potential avatars all over the world who can be you know, the, the Google street map um, for mapping um, the, the virtual version of the actual world and whatever kind of, of activities they are willing to share in a, a wearing cameras way can feed into a, you know, potentially identical meta space um, that, that, you know, travel can be sold in, that, you know, all kinds of things can happen in. And there's lots of wonderful and horrific um, experiences that you can imagine people virtually having owing to that network of con contributors. And, and yeah, the X-rated industry will totally figure it out. Um, you know, porn is always the pioneer, a lot of these things. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, oh. One thing I want to add in before I pass the mic to Stuart. Are you done? Sorry. Um, before passing the mic to Stuart, I, I want to throw one more fish on the table, which we haven't really talked about that much, but it's the blurring of reality. And it's like that Tongan dancer about to perform a native dance in VR is very likely to be your Ukrainian neighbor just down the block. And not Tonga and not nothing. I like you don't know who's behind the artifacts, where they live, where they're hosted, what connection they have to authenticity. Maybe they have an NFT minted to prove their uh, pedigree and origins. That's maybe interesting. And maybe maybe uh, indigenous tribes around the world make a fortune by minting NFTs that prove that people belong to them or that things are authentic. Hmm. How about that? Uh, that's kind of a crazy dystopian future way, but it's better than casinos maybe. Uh, Stuart, over to you. With, with sorry, having having placed that smelly fish on the table, over to you. Uh, great. I, I'll, <laughs> I'll just transcend the, the the smelly fish and go someplace else. Uh, I wanted to pick up on what Ken said. I think about using uh, uh, this quote metaverse for good in some way. I remember um, way back in marketing uh, in 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 um, economics one hundred and one it was pointed out that uh, something like two thirds to 80% of all products uh, are about marketing and packaging, and packaging. So all of us are thinking, having been brainwashed into a capitalist universe about making money, and it kind of is the backdrop for so many different things. And I've been noodling with this idea of where the edges of quote, first amendments and freedom come in with the idea of, so how can we fix uh, a universe that's running out of resources. And I, I, like, I like the early conversation of so many people, um, you, know, you know, tech entrepreneurs trying to uh, look for a way off the planet as opposed to using their time, energy, resources to fix the planet. 
Um, what a wonderful opportunity to create an alternative world of a metaverse that actually mirrors the kind of world that most people would love to live in um, and use that as a way of kind of seeding or populating a different way of being in the real physical world that we're existing in. And, and maybe that's a, a, a kind of a, a way through some of the morass uh, that we're in. Thank you, Stuart. Um, uh, uh, Grace is pointing out that in, 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 on Facebook and everywhere else online, many of the entities we interact with aren't in fact authentic entities or individuals, they're bots, they're you know, swarms and storms. Uh, I was yesterday reading something that were reported out of political discussions and it turns out that when the SEC or somebody like that issued a, a uh, a public comment window, they got 12 million comments on something that was important. I don't remember what it was. It might've been net neutrality. They got 12 million comments and analyzing the comments, it was like 10 million of those 12 million were auto-generated. They were not actually authentic comments. The only good news was that the comments were split more or less evenly pro and con weirdly. So apparently the budgets on both sides were, were matching budgets or something. I don't know how that works out. Uh, Gil. Thank you, Ken. Always. Hmm? Say what? Go ahead, Gil. I'm reading. I'm reading Ken's post in the chat. Yeah, we'll take a moment. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, to Stewart's uh, thought, um, you know, this isn't going to change without thinking about the context that it's living in. Uh, you know, and there's been a little bit of mention of capitalism and rent seeking, and I mentioned uh, Varoufakis's latest piece on techno feudalism where he's basically asserting that, you know, for all the people who want to change capitalism, he said capitalism is already over. We're into techno-feudalism. It's, you know, it's like, it's like in the Middle Ages when the Lord would provide land and you would farm the land and the Lord would take half your crop. Uh, and now here's this, here's this farm called the metaverse and uh, the Lord takes your attention and your eyeballs and monetizes it and you, when you get, you get no economic value in return. Um, so I, I'm, I've been more uncomfortable in this call than I have in any OGM call that I've been on. Um, we're sort of dancing around the mess. I, I, I realized that maybe after, what, you know, uh, golly, 42 years online, uh, maybe I'm finally becoming a Luddite. <clears throat> but I just- can you, can you point to your discomfort? Can you, are you just, are you uncomfortable because these things seem so shitty? Are you uncomfortable because we're avoiding a hard truth that we're not talking about? I'm uncomfortable for multiple reasons. Yeah, the, both of those. Um, I'm uncomfortable with the um, with the headlong rush to escape physical reality. I'm a fan of the real world. Um, my orientation is biological, ecological, evolutionary. Um, you know, it's one of the things I share with Klaus. I see a great richness there. I see richness that we that we in this modern culture utterly ignore. Uh, and do our best to extract from and replace. Um, I'm, I'm baffled by why people want to have robotic hamburger flippers um, and robotic waiters and robotic doctors and robotic everything else, because I think there's an enormous richness in the messy, fuzzy, sloppy interaction of human beings. Um, um, I have, um, so it's, it's sort of in that direction. Um, um, the abandonment of, of real life, the abandonment of biological interaction, the desire to upload ourselves to another planet as if ourselves is a bunch of code. Um, you know, and there's the model of human ratiocination as a computer-like activity in our brains when in fact our beings are in our whole bodies, not our brains. Our thoughts are not in our brains, they're in our bodies and in our conversations with other people. There's just like a, 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 a you know, tragic simplification of humanity and the living world that I think is going on here in the context of late capitalism and an extractive um, reductionist, um, alienating, non-reciprocal system. Um, and, um, and those are its virtues. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, was, I was saying to a friend this morning that, <clears throat> that sort of one, one of my main lines that I've been peddling in my work for I don't know, 30 years has been that Earth's living systems 
have 3.8 billion years of experience, open source R&D in how to have you know, effective, efficient, adaptive, resilient systems. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The, you know, the work, the research has been done, there it is. Um, and my buddy Chauncey Bell challenged me a couple of weeks ago. He said, why are you using the word systems? That's like, that sounds so mechanistic for you who are you know, battling against mechanistic reductionist worldviews. And I started trying on replacing living systems with living world. And the question I find myself asking my clients these days is what would it be like? What might it be like to do business as though we belonged to the living world or to a living world? Not try to be nicer to it, treat it better, manage it better, but what if we belonged to it? What, are, what if we were of it? How would we think? In this conversation, I don't mean to point at us, but at Marky and his minions uh, have no interest in the living world. Um, there was a picture, I saw a picture yesterday of um, a, a conversation that I guess has been televised between Marky and Yuval Harari. And I don't know where it went, I didn't listen to it. I was just struck by the picture and the picture looked like, there's a picture in Marky's office or conference room or maybe they're the same thing. And it looked and felt like a very bad rendition of Second Life. So it's like, it's not only that he wants to take us into the metaverse, he's building a physical reality around himself that looks as flat mm -hmm. as, his, uh, as his face. And so- The Zuckerberg I, pitch was terrible, it was ugly. It was like this, was, this hideous 1995 retro metaverse. It was and weird. He was enthusiastic and cheering on stuff. So I, it's just like, it's, yeah. it, it's full of, this whole thing is full of cringy for me. And I wonder what might happen if we stopped using the word metaverse and called this something else. Because I, I agree, there's a pony in there, you know? And sometimes the pony gets developed through esoteric scientific applications or Klaus I never would have imagined. When you were starting to talk about meta, you know, agriculture and metaverse, I had no idea where you were going and you went someplace really interesting, you know? And we tend to forget that the commercialization of the internet came on the back of, of the porn industry. You know, there are various ways that things reach scale. Um, but I think the vision is important and the economic context is important and the, the socio-cultural intellectual frame, nod to George Lakoff, the frame in which we have the conversation is really important and it's already been captured by this, I think, very dangerous and, you know, and disease-ridden word. I'll stop there. Creeped out. <laughs> Jerry, I was wondering why I can't hear you, but it appears to be because you're muted. I, it's because I just did a newbie mistake. My apologies. And and Wendy, you were smiling, and I thought it was because of something clever I'd said, but it was because you noticed that I was lip, moving my lips and not being heard. So. Okay, so um, uh, where was I going? So part of the, um, oh, come on, now come back thought. Um, you were just talking about, uh, oh, I just got it back. So part of what I regret about part of the framing of this call of has Zuckerberg appropriated the metaverse and are we now, uh, you know, uh, or do we now have to fight to win it back or is it all over, et cetera, et cetera, is that it frames the whole conversation around his, his idea of the metaverse. And we suddenly are busy critiquing that and using that as the center of the conversation, as opposed to just going off and saying, hey, actually there's a better verse or there's a something else that, we're, that, that, that is already in progress uh, and let's figure out how to, how to actually build that thing. So I'm, I'm worried that, that Zuckerberg by mere presence of a, you know, a planet the size of Jupiter in our little orbital system uh, pulls us off toward it uh, merely by by its presence and by our paying a lot of attention to it. So uh, it could be that the it could be God willing. This is interesting. Uh, let's 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 wish that Zuckerberg's Meta is like the Superliga or whatever it was called, the Super League that happened in Europe, where uh, a bunch of the highest paid uh, soccer teams decided to create a separate league and not invite the other teams to play, and it lasted about a day. Uh, before the entire thing fell in a shambles and everybody's like, oh, joke from 2020. 
Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's no, there's plenty of things that Zuckerberg has done where he had a black thumb and they didn't go anyplace. Uh, so, Wendy. Yeah, so first <laughs> I was I was laughing at Grace's uh, post, actually, that the Suckerverse post, which I thought was funny. Um, yeah, I really uh, resonate with what um, Gil was saying a minute ago in terms of how we frame this, and then you you were echoing it too, Jerry, how, how we frame this, the questions that we ask matter greatly, right? If we ask what's wrong with Facebook, we st which is your point, Jerry, we stay in the space of trying to trying to fix Facebook or or right and and our and our thinking is now is limited to the box of what is instead of what's possible, right? If we ask what sort what what can technology do today that could help support human thriving or flourishing or pick your pick your <laughs> pick your word, then we start to move away from those boxes and start to say, well, hey, wait a minute, we could pull a piece from over here where VR really helps people in education learn something they never could learn or go a place or have an interaction with something that they could never learn in the classroom. And we could pick this over here where people are connecting and mentoring. So now you could have kids who maybe don't have access to education or really brilliant and need access to more education to customize their education and, and with mentors and with VR and with courses and with all these other, right? So already there's, there's one thread that where we're start to pull from what seemingly might seem now to be disparate pieces that easily could come together. Um, so I had posted before, you know, pe people, um, there's a lot of science now around the neurology of how, how we so quickly react to negative things, shock and awe, all that kind of stuff. It's just human, our human nature, and it's kept us alive and it keeps us, you know, paying attention to the lines and the things that'll kill us, which of course don't really exist in the world, most for most of us in the world today. So the other, I think, thread to this conversation is, and the questions we need to be asking are, how can we get attention on the things that matter, right? And, and a lot of that has to do with using technology to bring people's attention to the things that matter because they won't go there naturally. The masses won't go there naturally. They're going to go naturally. And this is where our media comes in. This is where all the, you know, where all those conversations about what's being put in front of us matter. To me, just getting good news out is in and, in and of itself incredibly powerful. We don't do that right now. Even just platforms, platforms that are like good news, like John Kaminsky put out um, some good news over, over um, COVID. And if you didn't see them, they were hilarious and they were a bright spot. And for six months for me or however long he was putting them out. Does Until anyone he sold the enterprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then so he sold it's, it to a media company. He's like, thanks. Been nice. Yeah. Yep. He got bought out and it got turned like it turned into nothing which was, yeah. I, I bet there was some part of that, I was supposing there was some part of that where he thought it would grow and instead they killed it, Yeah. right? So I, I, it's, it's just, this is the interesting thing. Um, and how do we work within the current system that's not based on the things that we need while we build the thing that we need um, is also a huge challenge. So there was a lot in there and I hope that wasn't confusing. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Um, Paul. Uh, first, I wanted to congratulate Klaus on that uh, new job, and um, I grew up in the Palouse Hills, and if, if you don't know what the Palouse Hills looks like, it's worth Googling some images. It is some of the most incredible landscape you've ever seen. <laughs> it's just a, a really stunning place, and so I hope you have lots of fun with the farmers up there. Um, and my one thought as I'm listening to this is, I'm, I don't know if these metaverses can escape what's true with the internet, but on the internet, you know, you, you do a search and your first page or two is all Amazon links. And you, the, you know, you make a whole bunch of money getting your link up onto the top and people are paying for it. And I'm just wondering, okay, a metaverse, how do you, find your way you go into a tavern and the guy says hey go to the the amazon castle over on the hill there and it was not called amazon but i was just wondering is the metaverse somehow going to have 
a search engine that cannot be commercially dominated. Um, thanks, Paul. That, that takes us back to a, a bunch of different questions, one of which is, um, which we didn't explore, a path we didn't explore that much, is the decentralized web, Web3, um, the crypto web, all these other kinds of emergent distributed systems, can they replicate the capacities uh, of the features of Facebook? Or if that's not desirable, can we sort of walk into that world in, in, in a wholesale way? Will, will that be a satisfying kind of metaverse experience? In which case, the things that John Kelly was postulating early in the call about self-sovereign ID and, and uh, being able to walk over with your data and all that would, I think, be baked into the, into the equation, into the platform. We would then have some autonomy and some ownership. One of the things that people love, 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 love about the crypto token NFT economy is like we own it. It's our assets. This is, you know, you can buy and sell and trade your avatar, your this, your that, um, which is interesting as opposed to uh, you're basically renting those objects from previous platforms uh, in different ways. So I think that's that's one of the threads that, that shows up here. Happy to explore others that uh, everybody else saw in there. Um, and let's go to Doug and Grace. Okay, I want to first uh, agree with all that Gil said in his quite passionate statement about uh, the loss of reality. To me, this conversation uh, makes me feel uh, queasy because I sense that the, the logic of modern times is integrating big data and uh, AI together to run the world. And I don't want to go there, but it seems to me like it's inevitable. And part of the problem with global warming is that it requires a whole systems approach, which is going to lead to more pressure to integrate everything together into a single system. And then the question is who owns that? But it's the monopoly technology that's going to dominate reality that it seems to me is the threat in this, that lies behind this conversation. Um, th this is happening, Doug, thank you for bringing that up because I see that in the Smarter Cities initiatives. I see that in precision agriculture and all kinds of other techno agriculture. And in, in a lot of these worlds, we are very, very, very easily moving into sensors and detectors and tracking of ever, absolutely everything. Smarter and smarter systems, some of which will be smartly stupid and will make colossal errors, some of which will be smarter than humans. Because I'm, I, you know, I look, I look at AlphaGo and AlphaZero and all those kinds of things. So I'm like, it's entirely likely that computers make better decisions than humans, un, humans under some conditions, and that's interesting, right? Um, but the alternative is to um, create fruitful initial conditions for holistic solutions and for nature to to, to sort of reintervene, um, and then to allow that to move forward and then behave appropriately in that world, which I think is the world that you and Paul and Gil. Um, are, are kind of pointing to and saying, hey, what, what's wrong with that one? What, what broke there? And I, and I fear that there are so many technophiles who see that uh, if we throw CPU cycles and artificial intelligence at all these problems, we'll solve them. We'll just science the hell out of this, that uh, I worry that we are totally slipping into the, the, the techno optimists uh, future here. So thank you for putting that in the conversation. Uh, Gil, then Grace, then Klaus. Bill, briefly, because it looks like you're yeah, commenting on exactly like that. The last thing, look, there's there's enormous value and potential for um, for using the, this gear to enhance human capacity. Uh, and for all that I might rail about AI, I am entirely comfortable getting on board an airplane where large portions of flight, including increasingly takeoff and landing, are computer managed. I got no trouble with that, but we get very confused about the difference between systems like airplanes as complex as they are, and systems like farms, which dwarf the airplanes in their complexity. Uh, and don't, and, and I would argue, do not lend themselves to AI approaches. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Grace and Klaus. All right, cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say airplanes are complicated more than complex, but, um, yeah, so you had asked this question about these multiverses and the, the, the distributed systems, and I've seen some really interesting um, potential there. And, and, I, and, I, and I really relate 
to what, what, what Paul mentioned about this, like, you know, brought to you by Amazon or brought to you by Facebook. And our cities are like that now too. You know, I think I mentioned that in one of these things. It's like, you go to the city and it's like, there's all this pollution. There's, it's just advertising pollution everywhere. And it's just this, this horrifying thing. I've seen some really interesting potential models and I'm seeing more and more talk in the Web3 universe about personal ownership. I mean, that's what NFT games are kind of pointing at. Okay, you're gonna own your own equipment instead of I spent all my time building up this really creative world in whatever it is in, in, in Minecraft, but it's owned by Microsoft. But no, you've got this NFT and I built it and I own it and I can trade it and all that stuff. So there is this idea that people can own the things they create. Um, I would say, again, connecting to what Gil said, it's like just the ownership model kind of grosses you out a little bit one way or the other because we're part of a natural system. So this thing of like, I own something always has that kind of like weirdness about it like oh i own this part of the metaverse it's like well i don't know whatever you know maybe in the metaverse you could say that but maybe you couldn't it's just built by all of us together so i've seen some really promising stuff and i think that one of the things that decentralization allows or maybe just kind of will happen because things will implode is that the founders kind of come in and they do this ico and they raise this money and they kind of make this speculative capital but there is this way of like wanting to let go of the project because I made enough money already and it's not an owned thing. So you don't sell it to a larger company and it, it, it and it becomes this whatever universe in and of itself. And people ask this weird question here in, in the decentralized world, like who's going to be the 800 pound gorilla, which is a really weird question, because if you go to the jungle, it's not like the 800 pound gorilla has more power than an ant you know, an anthill or the anthills as a whole, or the 800 pound gorilla isn't more- Or the river. Or the river, right? Like, it's just this weird, like, who's gonna be, and I think the decentralized world and the metaverse is pointing towards that, that they're gonna be, even within the games themselves, I see people talking about, okay, there's gonna be, you see this in EVE Online, actually, like there's safe areas that you can go to. And then there's areas where um, there are these bots. And then there's like bot hunters, that are like the 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 players themselves are self policing the game, and so you're really seeing these things start to become more integrative and have different types and places that you can go. And so I think that decentralization does have this potential to have this. Um, and and I'm and I'm not as concerned about interoperability. I mean, interoperability is kind of a simple thing. Like when I think about interoperability, it's more like you could see of like animals as interoperable. It's like, okay, well, we know about gravity and we know about plants and there's water, there's salt water and there's fresh water. There's like these very, you know, and if it's, if, and if it's yellow and black, probably you shouldn't eat it. That's probably a warning. And these kind of very simple rules of interoperability, but you mostly live on your continent and you're better off there anyway. You know, so that's what I'm seeing. Thank you, awesome. Uh, Doug, I think your hand is still up from before. Um, and Klaus, if you would jump in. Yeah, I, I, what, what I see is the, what I call techno escapism hit an immovable object called nature, right? Um, you, you, you still have, um, I mean, and, and we are really seeing this right now because the Palouse project is, is significantly, uh, uh, has a significant potential to really provide us with this proof of concept uh, that we have been trying to, to establish. I mean, we have uh, uh, 150,000 acres of, of land that is being uh, used by you know, 32 farmers uh, who, when, when, we, when we engaged you know, and we presented the idea of whole systems change, meaning community farm the fork, right? Um, we had an, an amazing response because next week we're meeting with the local university, with the college catering, with the local food hub, you know, with uh, several NGOs and so on, who, who all understand that the, the soil in the Palouse has been severely degraded. I mean, these farmers truly understand that they are at risk for, uh, for having diminished you know, the potential and capacity of their soil. And that's really what it all comes down to is to repair 
and, and redeem the soil back to health. And when you do that, then you have to then you have to to create behavioral adaptations and adjustments, meaning we have to change our menus and so on. So we're bringing in the college catering uh, group um, and, and to talk with the farmer to say, what do you think we could be producing here that will restore that soil? You know, with the design imperative being whatever we call must restore the soil microbiome. And so how can you integrate these products into your uh, college in, into your catering operation where they serve thousands of meal every, meals every day. And, and, and so I think where, where, where I'm going is there will be a reality break. You know, we are heading towards a reality break where uh, uh, all this technology that's coming online is not being used, you know, for its potential. I mean, this meta thing there, yeah, I mean, I can see us connecting with other farmers, you know, where you can show technologies, you can show techniques and so on. Um, I don't know if you need this technology, but there is so much available, right, in forms that we can connect across platforms. And the one driving force that nature is imposing on us is that we must decentralize, right? Because you cannot top down restore a community back to health. It has to be bottom up. Yeah. So I was in a, I was uh, uh, teaching uh, a class to uh, the citizen climate lobby a couple of days ago on uh, the Growing Climate Solutions Act and all that. And, and I had you know, a young lady in, in, the, uh, the, uh, in the group from Wisconsin, and she goes, look, I'm, I'm living in you know, a small community in the middle of agricultural fields all around us. They're growing grains like no end, mostly for biofuels, right? We don't have food to eat. There's nothing being grown you know, in our area that we can actually eat. And, and, and she goes, and by the way, our average income is $19,000 a year. Now you try to live for $19,000 a year. So, I, I mean, I'm, you know, it just flows you when you are in, in when, you, when you become inclusive, right? When you allow such voices to, to surface in, in broader discussions, it's moving. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. When you go into into these communities and see how much unnecessary uh, hardship there is, completely unnecessary, right? So um, yeah, I think I think uh, we have that community on fire already. I mean, we're just you know setting up uh, the, you know to to. Uh, is, is that a controlled burn, or do you mean emotionally? Ah, emotionally. <laughs> But you know, Washington State University Extension is, is really progressive uh, in agriculture. Washington State is a phenomenal state. I mean, Starbucks started there, right? The micro pool gray started there. I mean, when you look at how many companies have originated in there that we sort of take for granted, Amazon, right? So, so I think um, there, is a, there is a perfect breeding ground, right? For, for doing something that just brings a community together and builds a case study, yeah. but but I yeah I think we're running straight into a wall, and we just I just hope we can turn the corner before we really crash into it. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Totally agree. Um, we're nearing the end of our our call time. This has been really fun and fruitful and juicy for me. Uh, one thing I wanted to steer us toward that I didn't put on the table that I didn't steer us toward was. Uh, what to love and what to hate about metaverse visions, like what's good and what's bad, so that we can kind of tease them out a little bit. I'm going to do that on my own in my brain. Um, um, Pete, just a, a thought to put in your head. This feels like maybe it's an episode of Weaving the World, and we it, it might be really interesting to have a post uh, a fungus episode about this call, meaning by which I mean uh, to just sit with what we put on the table during this call and look at it deeper, slow it down. I get a transcript of this recording. This call is one of the Thursday calls, so we'll automatically get a pretty good otter uh, recording with, I think, speaker IDs and all that. So that's really good because it, it sort of jumps us forward. Um, so I'm, I'm actually thinking of harnessing what we've done here uh, and bringing it into Weaving the World and seeing where that goes because there's a, there's a whole lot that's on the table. And I would love to revisit the topic and I'm very interested in different people's notes, maps, connections, 
weavings around this. Whether you're a Rome fan and you've been taking notes in Rome, or if Mark Carranza were here, his own tool MX, or whatever else that might be, how those things fit together and what we might do with it. So I just wanted to put that in before we wrap the call so that we can be thinking, I think, that way about it. Um, and for those of you who, who are not aware, um, I'm cranking up a, a video and audio podcast called Weaving the World, uh, where we talk about solutions to world's problems and then try to weave those solutions into a shared context, a shared uh, base of wisdom that I'm, because I love metaphors too much, uh, calling the big fungus. Uh, so uh, us collaboratively uh, cure, uh, farming this symbiotic fungus, which is the, the collected wisdom that we now lock away in books and other things that have way too much IP uh, associated with them. Uh, when is what playing, Gil? Your podcast, sir. Uh, we're busy recording the first test episodes now, and, and it, uh, it'll be... Uh, I've created a, uh, there'll be a new stream, we'll announce it online. There are two channels on uh, the Mattermost server if you want to sort of be in the, in the conversation. Uh, there's one called Weaving the World, which is meant kind of as a, as a chat for the podcasts. And there's another one called WTW Ops, which is the operations channel uh, to talk about how to stand up the podcast, what it should look like, uh, other kinds of things like that. Um, oh, cool, thanks, Pete. Anybody with concluding thoughts for this call, like um, uh, including process thoughts, like, whoa, we went all over the place and, and we did, we, we put a whole bunch of really interesting and meaty topics on the table here, uh, many of which deserve sort of their own calls and follow ups, many of which echo things that are really strong in our ongoing conversations, like, hey, the house is on fire, why aren't we acting like it? Uh, Right, and COP26 is just over with now, and it's, I think, disappointing to a lot of people and heartening to a few. Uh, so how do these things fit? Uh, please, Stuart. Yeah, uh, first time on the call, and thank you, everyone. Um, I, I think it, it, though it got down into the weeds at certain moments in time, those weeds are not, not places that I inhabit, but I love the idea, and it came from a number of people on the call, of how do we use this stuff for good? How do we use it to really address the, the great challenges that we're facing now as a species? Love that. Thanks, Stuart. And I'd love to focus on that as well. And, and there's, a, there's a unicorn uh, sparkle pony somewhere in here. And I think, we can, I think we have enough sort of insight and experiments to, to start to show where the pony is and what it, what it smells like. And it smells good. It smells a lot better than horse manure, which is the typical scent I associate with horses. Horse manure um, smells good. I like the smell. smell. See, see, it's the smell of wholesome. It's a fresh, <laughs> wholesome, you know, it really is. It's natural. A, it's a natural. Fresh, as opposed to chicken manure, which is awful. <laughs> I will bring you some fresh horse ejecta shortly, just so you can enjoy the scent. Well, there's just um, in horse manure and horse shit. <laughs> oh, good point. Good point. Um, any, other, any other thoughts about this process and what, how we could make it better? Uh, Grace, let me just put you on the spot. What, what could we do um, uh, better about this? And I think there's like 50 different things we could do better. Yes, you. Um, you in the booth with the earphones and the, the, the spiral stairway behind you and the, the whole thing. Yeah. This is, this is because I wrote a book on this or something. Is this like I'm putting put on the spot because I wrote a book about the pro, you know, organizational process? I, I don't know. It could have something to do with that, but that's a long shot. Well, better is in relation to what, right? In relation to an outcome. And I think one of the things that we're discovering or rediscovering as humanity and as people who are doing collective intelligence is that in the, the general outcome of this kind of discussion is an unspoken feeling of connection among us. And you can't structure that. So I don't have a sense that we could have done anything better. I love that, Grace. Thank you. Um, still, I think we could do a lot of things better, but I still love what you just said. Um, Jerry? I think it was a great- Yes, idea. please. I, I had a friend who worked at IDEO for 22 years, and he said, you know, we used to run our meetings at the end. We do that plus delta, you know, what did you like? What did you not like? And what did you change? And they realized over time it left people 
would, they would walk away from the meeting focused on what they didn't like because because that's what stuck in their minds. So they adopted a process or, or, or a practice of, of asking, th of having people fill in three sentence completion exercises. I liked, I wish, I wonder. So I liked, really loved, you know, the, the range in this conversation and um, hearing from all the different people. I learned a lot. I'm not up on the metaverse at all. I feel completely, you know, outside of this. I don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. So I really like that. I wish we could have heard from everybody. I think there's some people on the call who still didn't participate. And I wonder going forward how we can um, how we can combine our, our efforts for a, a better understanding that we might actually um, find some leverage in the world to, to move, you know, things in a better direction. Thanks, Ken. I'm, I'm also, let's post these three questions in the Mattermost channel for the calls for this call. And let's answer those as we wish. I would love, I would love that as feedback on this call. Um, that'd be fantastic. So we'll, I'll just post these three questions and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Um, that's a really nice way to, to wrap the call. Thank you for the, thank you for that thoughtful ending. And thank you all. I'm going to go back to work on the X-Wing. I'm pretty sure I can download some new firmware and get it to fly again. So. Bye, everybody. Have a Thank great you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.